So, like Dave said, my grandfather's philosophy was about a win-win strategy, business strategy, and it was more than that. I thought I'd start by showing you uh, a little bit about who my grandfather was and some of the photos. Um, that little guy on the right looking down at the pond, my grandfather had just uh, dressed us up in our uh, new, uh, brand new Navy uh, sailor suits, and the big guy's me getting ready to uh, jump in. <laughs> which uh, to his brand new pond, so I, he was none too happy with me that day. But it was pretty fun anyway. Um, what I'd like to share with you starts in uh, uh, June of 1980. But before I start, I want to tell you really what I want to do is, is my aim today is to offer a different perspective, a different lens through which to look at your organization, your systems, and your people through the eyes of my grandfather, some executives that he worked with and I had the pleasure to get to know and spend time with, and then also through my own experience starting a business, fending off private equity, getting the thing up and running, and then making the mistake of selling out, doing my two years penance and getting out of there. The blessing for me in that respect was I ended up going and volunteering to work at the Deming Institute. Um, but my journey really started in June of 1980. I was a 20-year-old student at UCLA. I was headed back east to spend the summer with my beloved grandparents. Shortly after I arrived in Washington, D.C., my mother called me and said, your grandfather, who you know traveled around the world and spent a lot of time in Japan, is going to be featured on an NBC primetime documentary titled, If Japan Can, Why Can't We? And we heard Tom talk a little bit earlier about what was happening with Japanese products, goods, and services that were higher quality, low cost than what was being produced in the United States. If Japan can, why can't we? Tremendous amount of interest. That evening, she wanted to make sure I watched it with my grandparents. That evening, I went downstairs into my grandfather's tiny, cramped office where he had consulted from the last 50 years. We went upstairs, sat in front of the television with my grandmother, and we started to watch the program. About a minute into the program, my grandfather came on the screen, and you heard him say these nine prophetic words. What can we do to work smarter, not harder? Now, I'm only 20 years old, but I know it's all about hard work and best efforts and all that type of stuff. This smarter stuff didn't make any sense to me. So I continued to listen. They didn't mention my grandfather for almost an hour in the program. He wasn't too happy about what he was hearing from the rest of the speakers that they were interviewing and talking to, and I had to keep him from going downstairs. But right near the end, they started talking about an American who was responsible in large part for the Japanese economic miracle after World War II. And he was an American. I thought, heck, my grandfather had been to Japan. He had to know this guy. So I turned to him and said, hey, who, you, you must know who he is, only to find out it was my grandfather. I'm like, I'm sitting next to you? How could I be 20 years old? and not know this. Well, he was such a humble man. Whenever our families were together, it was about family. It wasn't about business. It wasn't about business. Towards the end of that program, they started to talk, right after this announcer was going through this, they started to talk about a company called the Nashua Paper Company. Nashua, New Hampshire, $670 million company, run by William E. Conway, who was the chairman and CEO. And Conway came on and said, we had a challenge. We were looking to get into the copy business, and we had a big problem. The problem was, we didn't know how to do it, and we couldn't do it better than the Japanese were doing at the time. So I reached out to my Japanese counterpart and said, how did you do this? And he said, the answer's right in your backyard, and it's an American. So Conway reaches out to my grandfather, they start to work together, and the changes were stunning in that company. Absolutely stunning. The amount of money they made, the amount of money they saved, the impact on their employees 
was astounding. The differences they made in a short period of time. Conway was so impressed that he called my grandfather the father of the third wave of the Industrial Revolution. And he said later that for those who will be surviving 100 years from now, being able to use and employ these ideas and methods will be critical to you. Well, one of the other people watching the program, and by the way, there were many, many executives and CEOs who were watching. They didn't know the answer either. One of them that was watching was a gentleman named Don Peterson. Some of you may remember him. He was the former chairman and CEO of the Ford Motor Company. And Don was in deep trouble. They had lost, lost at that time, in 1980, 150, I mean, I'm sorry, $1.5 billion, the largest corporate loss in American history at that time. They were in danger of going under. He reached out to my grandfather and said, will you come help me? My grandfather said, come meet with me. He met with him, and he said, I'll do it under two conditions. First condition is, this has to start at the top. You're the executive. You're the leader. Any transformation has to start at the top. And he agreed. The other one is constancy of purpose, which can happen a lot more in family-run businesses. That constancy of purpose that you're going to keep with this, this is not a flavor of the month approach. This is going to take a lot of hard work. Peterson said, I agree. Shortly thereafter, my grandfather shows up in Detroit. Peterson and his executive team meet him. They go in, they meet with all. Peterson had brought everybody from all over Ford Motor Company, all the division heads. Everybody was there. They did introductions. And Don said, let's go ahead and get started, doctor. He said, my, a couple of my executives and I have to go off to a supplier meeting, but once you get started, I've brought everybody in as the top leadership. <laughs> so Peterson's walking out of the room. He turns to one of the executives and says, hey, do you think this guy can do it? And he looks and he's like, oh, Dr. Deming, why are you standing behind me? My grandfather had his briefcase. He said, I'm headed to the airport. He said, what do you mean? I thought we were getting started. He said, if you're not in that first meeting, you don't have to be in every meeting but you have to show that you are behind this, engaged in this, buy into this. Peterson canceled his meeting, sat in, and the rest was history. By 1988, Peterson was named executive and most productive executive of the year. Ford actually, for the first time in many decades, was more profitable than General Motors, and a lot of you may remember quality as job one. So when I met Peterson at a conference that I got him to speak at for the Deming Institute, I got to spend the whole day with him and question him. And what I want to share with you next is what I learned from Peterson and from some others executives that Don had spoken with. What you're seeing here is what threw them for a loop to begin with. When he sat down with them, he said, describe your organization as a system. Tell me about your organization. They brought in org charts. They showed them where all the businesses were, you know, how everything was working, all that stuff. He kept asking. And I've, I've heard a couple speakers talk about asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. My grandfather kept asking. They said, well, we're not getting what you're talking about. I want to know what the process is. What you're seeing here, he told me, this is a modernized version of what my grandfather put up for the Japanese after World War II at every single workshop and seminar he did in Japan. 80% of the capital of Japan attended those workshops in the 50s. And they looked at the country as a system. They, they looked at their individual organizations and businesses as a system. But he said the key was, and if you look on it, is as they started to describe the system, it was amazing. When they described the system, guess what they never brought up? They never mentioned their suppliers. They never mentioned on the left-hand side the inputs into the system. They thought it was the people and maybe the process. They never talked about the outputs, positive outcomes, negative outcomes. He said, we have to understand that because that impacts everything within that system. <clears throat> he said, the other thing is, it's clear, there's nothing here that you have made visible. He said, if we can make this visible for your organization, then we have a better opportunity to work on it. We're not just throwing a dart against a board and hoping this change is going to work. Having that insight, that visibility. Now, when you look at those three gears in the middle, and I only put a couple of them in there, 
All of those, he said, once you made it visible, what became clear at Ford was everything was so siloed. And he said, if everything's siloed, every one of those silos is optimizing themselves, sometimes to the detriment of the entire organization. He said, if we can break down those silos and have them understand the interdependency, you have this tremendous opportunity to be more effective, efficient, and productive. So when you look at those inputs on the left, you have chosen inputs. You can pick your suppliers, you can pick your people, you can pick your location, you can pick all sorts of stuff. You have imposed inputs, rules, regulations, IRS requirements, local, federal, all these different requirements. You have no choice on those. You have to build your system to accommodate those imposed inputs. Well, nobody was expecting this to happen. COVID as an imposed input, we weren't planning to do that. The people, everybody wanted to or needed to work from home. They couldn't come in. That's an imposed input on your system. If you think, and what Peterson told me was, if you think when a disaster comes along that the system you have designed is still going to be able to accommodate the positive outcomes you want, happy, delighted customers, all of those type of things with the existing system, he said, you've got a problem because it's not going to work. It can't work. It may work for some period of time, but you need to understand that system. And it's so much easier if it has been made visible. It takes some time to do it, but it's really worth it. The next thing Peter told me, Peterson told me was, your grandfather talked about 94% of the potential and capability of any organization is the design of the system. 94% of the potential and capability of any organization is the design of the system. So when I think, and I remember talking with Dave about people first, and we spent a lot of time talking about that, my grandfather was so focused on people first that the people were so important. But the key thing was, by what method do you make them more effective, efficient, and productive? How do you do that? And you know what we do? Not everybody in here, I'm sure. We spend all of our time, not all of our time, we spend so much of our time focused on that 6% improving the people. There's nothing wrong. You need to do training. You need to do all this type of stuff. But the potential to work on the system is absolutely dramatic. And I said, okay, Don, what else? What else? Tell me a little bit more. He said what he came to us and said was, there are certain things you can stop doing that will drive out fear, which is one of the biggest things that happens in the workplace, that you can drive out fear, which leads to greater innovation, greater joy in work, and right now we've got a big problem with employee retention. How do you make the employees more happy? How do you have them more engaged? Well, it may be a barbecue, but you know, they're coming back into the same system. And what he said was, there are certain things that you can stop doing, not right away. You have to understand the impacts on the system up and down. He said some of the th these are the things that can have dramatic impacts on your organization and your people if you stop doing them. Now, I only have a little bit of time, so I'm only going to touch on one of them, performance appraisals. I remember calling my grandfather and saying, I love performance appraisals. The company I was in, that was an imposed input. Performance appraisals. I loved them because I got good performance appraisals. You ask the people who don't get as good of a performance appraisal, they're not so happy about the whole concept. So I asked my grandfather, so what's a better practice than appraising the people? He said, well, number one, it doesn't really work. He said, first of all, it's subjective. And he told me some ideas. He said, if you have to do a performance appraisal, understand the concept of heuretics. If you like beer, I'm going to give you lots of beer before my performance appraisal. I'm going to praise you and tell you I love those shoes, I love the shirt, I love the jeans, I love every, and you cannot brown those enough. It will have an impact on that performance appraisal. It can't not. The way the human mind works, it will have an impact. And I thought, so what do I do? I thought this was interesting. He said, instead of a performance appraisal on the person, do a performance appraisal on the system they're working in. Appraise the system. 
the system is the constraining factor. That design of the system that's coming from top management, that system is the constraining factor of that individual being able to perform better. And yes, you're going to have people that are going to be able to perform between a certain level. And if you measure that out through statistical process control and their performance, not your subjective but objective performance, you're going to see there's variation. You may not like that variation. But what he said was, work on improving the system to reduce that variation rather than trying to work on the people. Because if that system is stable, you're still going to see that variation in the performance of people, no matter what. But you don't like it, so you improve the performance of the system. Because if you're working on things like quotas, commission, numerical goals, um, incentives, all those type of things, and somebody earlier this morning talked about incentives, what it does is the incentive does not. Incentives work, I will tell you. Short term, they work. There's absolutely no question about it. But what the incentive does is it doesn't give you a clear understanding of the capability of the system. Because if you give me enough money, I'm going to do something. Even if it means harming the company, I'm going to get there. I'm going to hit. Somebody else was talking about quotas. I'm going to hit that quota, even if it means I'm going to ultimately destroy the company or have a negative impact on that company. There's no two ways about it. And if the other thing Peterson said, Deming said to him, well, if performance appraisals work so well on an annual performance appraisal, two things. Do you ever get anybody that has a one or a two out of, let's say, a scale of 10? And, the, and Peterson said, yeah, sure. He goes, why would you let them perform at a one or two for the entire year and tell them at the end of the year, oh, by the way, I didn't like your shoes all year long. Instead of telling, I'm going to wait till the performance appraisal at the end of the year to tell you that, even though it was important enough to me to put it on the performance appraisal. Imagine that. And if they work so well, why not do them every six months? Well, if they work so well doing them twice a year, why not do them every three months or every month or every week? Well, it's not really feasible. But if you can work on the performance of the system, the ability of that person to perform better within the organization, and you get to work together, think together, learn together, act together, you're getting that interaction with them that you want. Incredibly powerful. Now, what I'd like to end with is showing you a video that I had put together of uh, it's interesting, most of the people on our board of directors for our nonprofit, they're all multi-generational. They're com companies, some of them start in the 1800s and early 1900s. And I wanted to show you a short video of a gentleman named Jack Hillerick who was on our board for 22 years. I got to know him very well. Um, you'll recognize his products here. And hear it from him rather than just from me um, of what he experienced. It's about three and a half minutes long. And I think you'll really appreciate it and what he's going through and how it impacted him, his family, and his company. My grandfather was an avid amateur baseball player. At the time, Louisville was a major league city. And the star player was a fellow named Pete Browning. And my father got him to come into his woodworking shop, and he turned a ball bat for him. And that's how the bat company got started. My father passed away, and I became president. We were making six million baseball bats a year, a million golf clubs. At the time, I was saying to myself, we need to improve the quality of our products. So I went to Dr. Deming's seminar thinking that he was going to help me make a better baseball bat. I was there for maybe 40 minutes when I found out we weren't talking about making better products. We were talking about making better managers, better people, and treating our people a whole lot differently than what I've been doing. I heard so many things that were unique and different. For instance, everyone is a willing worker. Then he would talk about 85%, 90% of the problems belong to management. That just didn't ring a bell at all. I mean, obviously the problem was we had bad products because the workers just didn't build them right. You know, it was their fault, not ours. So he grabbed my attention. We left the seminar with the book, Out of the Crisis. I started looking at, well, maybe I should look at some of these 14 points. 
These were the actionable points that you could take back and do something about. It. Education, the willing worker, cease dependency on inspection. These are things we'd see progress with, which gave us the right to explore and expand to the whole 14 points and to the whole philosophy. He said, eliminate all your inspections. At the time, we had 30 inspectors. How can we make a quality product without inspecting the product? He would say, you can't inspect quality into the product. You have to build the quality into the product. Aha, uh -huh, the lights went off. Why do we need somebody to inspect quality that we know that's not right? Why don't we make quality right the first time? So we eliminated inspectors. We worked on the process, we eliminated the inspectors, and all kind of good things happened. Deming stressed that you have to have a critical mass. Jack, you can't by yourself make this happen. But with critical mass, we were able to go out and tell the rest of the employees, this is what we're going to do. Well, the first one we eliminated was the ranking of our employees. We had a system from one to six, and that's how your pay was adjusted. Well, you'd sit down with your, your supervisor, and you would go head to head trying to justify your rating. People were protecting their job. It was like, I can't show you how I'm doing it because my pay depends on me knowing this and you don't. We opened the door for everybody to participate. The whole culture just, just was totally different. You get things done, and the employees wanted to get things done before, but they couldn't because the system was in the way. We were a wood company and never touched a piece of aluminum. When we put the trust in the people and we said, okay, guys, how do we make aluminum bat and how do we make it better? They just jumped right in and said, here's how we do it, versus for us going out there and telling them how to make a aluminum bat. They came out and said, if you do this, it'll be better. Deming said, if you don't change, you won't stay in business. Deming helped us change. The dollar sales more than triple. The total was at least three or four times what it was. This was a life change for me. It changed the way I worked in the company, my family life too. What he's talking about as a willing worker, and all, that applies to my children. That applies to my family. We scold our family, we get upset, but they're trying their hardest. They're, if everything applies to what he's talking about is applying to your life as a whole. Thank you all, I appreciate the time here, and I must say I am so honored to have met so many of you and to hear how exciting it is to hear that there are organizations out there care about people that are moving towards that and all the stuff that you talk with, uh, with Tugboat. So thank you very much, Dave, and all, to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.